text, um, we, we've missed a little piece of action. Uh, what's happened just before the disciples and Jesus have this dialogue about clean and unclean is that the Pharisees have accused the disciples of not properly washing their hands before they eat. Uh, there's a ritual for this. And so uh, the disciples, say the Pharisees, have defiled themselves before God. And so uh, Jesus is turning the tables on them a bit and saying, look, people, why do you get so tangled up in the letter of the law? Can you not hear what God is saying to you in the spirit of the law? You are so legalistic that here we're talking about dietary restrictions when I'm talking about building relationships. And then Jesus goes on to deal with uh, what goes into the mouth, goes into the stomach, goes out into the sewer, and that'll preach. <laughs> but indeed, what goes into the mouth is not what we're talking about, is it? It's what comes out of the mouth. And once again, at children's moments, we could put up our hands and remember the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and be released. Uh, because what we heard here is so true for us. We, we can't put those words back in our mouths, can we? We can't take them back. Um, I, I was talking to mom and dad this week about this text because I really have been wrestling with it. And dad gave me a beautiful quote uh, that I did a little bit more research on, and it, interestingly enough, has been attributed to a lot of people, from Lao Tzu to uh, Gandhi to Margaret Thatcher. <clears throat> so here it is. Be careful of your thoughts, for your thoughts become your words. Be careful of your words, for your words become your actions. Be careful of your actions, for your actions become habits. Be careful of your habits, for your habits become your character. Be careful of your character, for your character becomes your destiny. The Pharisees don't get it, do they? They are the blind leading the blind. And they're both going in the ditch, aren't they, Dylan? So that's not too hard. We get it, right? Well, be careful. Don't, don't let your thoughts lead you astray. Fine. But let's put that text aside. That's the first story uh, in uh, the language of the church. It's called a pericope. It's a fun word. So the first pericope deals with this clean and unclean issue. And we get it. That's not too bad. But then we've got this second story, uh, a break in the, in the text. And Jesus leaves Galilee. He leaves uh, the Jewish area of the Israelites around the Sea of Galilee. And he goes to the northwest, um, up to the coast on the Mediterranean Sea, to two cities, Tyre and Sidon. Now, these cities are outside of the Jewish territory. They're gent it's Gentile territory, non-Jews, people who worship in a different way, worship yeah completely separately. And uh, these folks are known to be the enemies of the Jews. So this is where Jesus and the disciples go. Um, and we have this encounter with a Canaanite woman. Now, uh, in the day that Jesus was there, calling someone a Canaanite woman was anachronistic, it's out of time. It doesn't make sense time-wise because Canaan has long since ceased to exist. Canaan has been destroyed, that there is no Canaan. And so calling her a Canaanite woman calls up all of this painful history of war and struggle. It would be similar to us meeting someone and calling her a confederate woman that just we don't do that we it doesn't make sense right so that's the first
first thing that's a little bit puzzling. <coughs> then we go on, and this text unfolds in a very strange drama, doesn't it? Jesus meets this woman. She comes to him shouting. In the text, the word shouting is the same word that the disciples were using in the boat last week when they were rocking around in the storm. Remember, there was a, a feeling of terror. So it's that kind of a shout. It's a desperate shout. Jesus, please hear me. But I'm, I am desperate for you to heal my daughter who is possessed of a demon. And so Jesus does what? Ignores her. He ignores her? He does nothing. He just ignores her. And so her shouts become more desperate. And the disciples say, Jesus, send her away. She is so annoying. Jesus, send her away. And so Jesus responds and says, child, thank you for coming. No. What does he say? I have only come to take care of the Israelites, the children of Israel, the Jews. She is not a Jew. I have not come here to care for you. This is not my job. Go away. And so she responds once again by falling on her knees before him. Jesus, I know you can heal my daughter. And now he embraces her and anoints her and the spirit is poured out. Right? Right? No, not yet. Not yet. We, now he says, it's not good to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Oh my gosh. Friends, in context, in Jesus' day, to call someone a dog was so derogatory. It's not quite the N-word, but it's not bar. Jesus, what? So this is the passage Roy leaves me with. <laughs> so listen, I read a lot. I had no idea what to do with this. No idea. And so I listened to what other people had to say. I went back to the text. I worked it over. I prayed over it off my knees. I'm like, dear God, please help. What is this supposed to mean? And here's what I heard. What would you do? What would you do? in that situation. What happens when those that we respect, who we look to, who provide us mentoring, who guide us, what happens when those we respect behave badly? How do we respond? So as I was reading, I, I, I really heard two themes of how people treated this text. So the first thing was, oh, this is playful Jesus. Jesus is playing. He's playing with the woman, saying, oh, lady, come on, come on, you can do better than that. He's playing with the disciples. Hey, let's, let's see what, what they'll do if I respond this way. Let's see if they get it yet. What do you think? He's playing even in the choice of the word dogs. It's not really dogs. It's puppies. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not even kidding you. I'm not even kidding you. People, there are people who went to this text and said, that's not so bad. It's just puppies. Oh. Oh. Okay, 
do, do anybody? Anybody okay with that? No. That's not my Jesus. So the second big theme that I read and heard is this is this is human Jesus. This is Jesus in all of his humanity. Remember what we do at the end of each service. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the dual nature of Christ. He's fully human and he's fully divine. Well, this is that moment when divine went on vacation. <laughs> and all we got is human. How's that? You okay with that? No, I'm not okay with that. I'm not. Uh, you can't separate the humanity and the divinity in God. You cannot take those two apart. There's not a moment when Jesus is human and the divine. They are integrated together. So, what do we do? What do we do with this text? What do we do? What are we going to do? Oh, <laughs> guess what? I'm not going to tell you. Because <laughs> I'm still wrestling with it. But here's what happened to me. Here's, here's what happened through the course of this week as day after day I'm wrestling with this text. So the first thing that happened, obviously Charlottesville had just happened last weekend when I came to this text for the first time. So I, you know, we, we put Peter away and got out the text for this week and realized that this really is where we are. This is where we are as a nation. This is where we are as a people. We're wrestling with this. How do we deal with each other? Who, how do we build relationships with those we deem different, who are not like us, who worship in a different way, who eat a different kind of food, who speak a different language, who on and on and on. How do we deal with people who are different? So in response to the Charlottesville incident, uh, Jonathan Reckford, who's the CEO of Habitat for Humanity International, put out a wonderful statement, and it went to anybody that signed up on the, on the mailing list. And if you're not signed up, I, I encourage you to just pop onto the Habitat website and, and click on to be a part of the mailing list. And in his letter, he juxtaposed what was going on in Charlottesville with what was going on just a mile away from where the protests were happening. A mile away, women and men of all faiths, or of no faith at all, Women and men of different skin tones, different languages, got together and on one place picked up hammers and raised walls on a Habitat house. And that made me think about our own Habitat neighborhoods here in Collier County, where communities are built and families who come from many different places who are a rainbow of skin tones, who speak different languages inside their homes, live uh, together peacefully, a diverse, truly diverse community. Why is this so hard? I had also the wonderful opportunity this summer to attend a brief intensive course at the Harvard Business School. So I came home with a Harvard t-shirt and uh, I was wearing it the other day and I was in Lowe's and the guy checked me out and said, oh, did you go to Harvard? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> For a week. <laughs> fantastic class and it was uh, there were 160 people there who were all leaders of nonprofits from all around the world and so there was a lot of great dialogue going on and we were uh, clustered in a, in a living group of eight so we had uh, this group of eight that we had to do a lot of intense work with and one of the conversations that came up was a, a, a racial uh, tension a conversation about race, racial tension and as we were working through it, um, it, it became a very heated conversation and there were lots of emotions going on on all sides. And after 
afterwards, some people stayed to work at it even further. And then that night, in our living group of eight, and in this group there were four of us who were from the United States and four from outside the States. From El Salvador, from Hong Kong, from Canada, and from Tasmania. And the four international friends, as we were seated around the table, said, why is this still an issue with you? Why, America, are you still dealing with this? Why? The other night, again, I've, I've done some more reading. My husband is so patient. And they prepared dinner, we ate dinner, and then after dinner, he was doing some channel surfing. He's in charge of that. And he landed on um, a, a movie. Uh, some of you will know its great storyline. The movie is Ice Age. And if you've not seen the movie, which I've not seen three quarters of the movie, just this last little part, here's what I learned about Ice Age. So there's this baby who's apparently gotten separated from his people. And the baby is now being rescued by this funny little trio of prehistoric animals. Uh, a woolly mammoth, a saber-toothed tiger, and a skinny sloth. Is it a sloth? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so they've got this baby, and they're trying to return the baby to the baby's parents. And so they're coming across the ice. And at some point, there's a volcano that bubbles up. And now that, those two things don't go together, right? Fire and ice. So the volcano comes up, and it's melting the ice. And so the, the, this group of animals and the baby are running along, and the ice starts disappearing from beneath them. And now, at this high drama, moment of high drama, the saber-toothed tiger is stuck. And there's this huge chasm of fiery lava, and the rest of the team is over on the other side. And so the, the tiger backs up, takes a running start, and leaps across. And you know what happens? He grabs hold of the glacier, just his claws, and he's holding on desperately. And the woolly mammoth looks back and realizes what's going on. Now, underneath the place where the tiger's holding on, it's all starting to melt. But the mammoth walks back out and reaches out with his trunk and slings the tiger to safety. <laughs> but that ice, that the, the ledge, the ice ledge that the mammoth is on now starts to break and it falls down into the lava and he's gone forever. But it's Disney, so the, the volcano springs up and it, it pushes, gushes the mammoth back up and sends him back to his friends. And the tiger says, why would you do that? And the mammoth says, well, that's what herds do. And then he looks around and he says, we're a weird herd. <laughs> And God spoke to me. <laughs> and the words of my Because I was thinking, we're a weird herd. <laughs> aren't we, William? Aren't we a weird herd? Look around. Look around. But the herd doesn't end here, does it? The herd encompasses all God's children. <laughs> we come to those times where we fall short of what God wants us to do. All of us. And in this moment, we find Jesus in this very strange story. This very challenging story. What's happening to Jesus? Is he growing? Is he learning? Is he realizing 
that God's kingdom has no <laughs> geographic boundaries. There is no border or limit to God's kingdom. It is not just for the Israelites, for the Gentiles, but for all God's people. God offers us all the bread of life. It is here for all God's children. We find ourselves in moments when we're involved in those tense conversations. The question that it raises is what will we do? What, what will I do when I'm faced with someone who says, no, this is not for you? I have some choices, don't I? I can stay silent. I can just wait for the conversation to pass by. It will. Something else will happen and the moment will move along. Safe. Ish. Or I can join in. I can pick up the call of the crowd and become a part of it. I'll get lost in it. That's pretty safe. And it'll move along. Or in those moments when there is a conversation about who belongs and who is excluded, I can stand up and I can speak out a word of justice, a word of mercy. <coughs> A word of grace. Uh, what would you do? Speak uh, out. In those moments when someone you respect uh, behaves badly, uh, what will we do? Stay silent? Pick up the call? Speak out? Uh, Stop. That's what my Jesus would call me to do. We are overheard. But we take care of each other. We watch out for each other. And we offer each other the bread of life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.